I will take my presentation to a personal level, but not my own story, but a story that I have heard from a number of Srebrenica survivors while I was an interviewer and development coordinator with the Genocide Film Library Project that the Cinema for Peace Foundation from Germany started in Bosnia in 2012. Um, I had the honor to meet ordinary people, and I think when we talk about genocide, we forget about ordinary people, about ordinary survivors and their lives and what we can learn from them. And essentially, I learned through that process that they are my main educators that I can read about research and that I can read all of the court judgments, but that at the end of the day, a personal story goes beyond that. It teaches you to listen, but to listen actively, to listen how they survived, what they remember, and what are they trying to teach us, how to prevent genocide, but also how to convey a positive message to future generations. Because we know that those countries that survived genocide are also prone to have genocide happen in their communities again. So here in Bosnia, we are definitely vulnerable, and especially uh, given that for the past 20 years, uh, genocide denial did not in decrease, but it actually increased. And given that this is the 20th anniversary, I would like to share three stories of three sisters that I have survived. And one of the reasons that I remember the three stories is that I realized that they never spoke to each other about what they survived and how they felt during the genocide. And what decisions they made, not only from 92 to 95, but afterwards. So the three sisters, they were underaged in 92, and they were still tr children trying to understand what was going on in their hometown of Svornik and why they had to flee their home in 93. And their stories were really simple until they started explaining the decisions that they made after 95. So the oldest sister was sort of the guardian, but she was very um, distant from the past. And during her interview, I learned that one of the reasons she was very distant in terms of how she described her experience is that the decisions that she made in 94 and in 95 changed her life changed her life. Um, to help her mother take care of her family because she had three younger siblings, she decided to get married at the age of 15. Now, when we think about a 15-year-old making such a decision, we sort of think that, you know, she had to make those decisions. But she decided that her mother needed to take her, care of her younger siblings, so she got married. And in the process, she also uh, got pregnant. And what is really um, very touching about her story is that by the time she was 18, she lost her husband to the death march, and she was left with a daughter uh, without a father and with a story that she could not share with her. And it was actually the first time that she shared her story in details with me. And I think one of the reasons, and she mentioned it very indirectly, that she decided to share her story was because she could not share it with her daughter. She wanted to have a copy of her story so that she can give it to her daughter, so that her daughter can learn from a very distant what her mother went through. Now, the middle sister, she was sort of the tomboy of the family, and she was very angry. And um, I've recorded 140 interviews, and this experience really taught me a completely different level, a completely different level of what anger means in a post-conflict society. And the middle sister was angry not at what happened in Srebrenica. That was not the main anger, but what happened to her family. She was angry at her older sister for sort of transferring the burden on her to take care of the younger siblings. So the older sister thought that she was doing the right thing by helping her mother take care of her younger siblings. But at the end, the middle sister felt that the burden was on her. And she carried it even after July 11, 95. And the younger, the younger one was eight when the genocide happened. So she remembers 93, 94, and 95. And her story resembled the story of her older sisters. But st what struck me the most is that after genocide, at the age of 18, she married so that she can help her mother take care of her younger brother. So when I listen to all of the three stories, they are the story of genocide. 
We can put aside the definition, we can put aside the court judgment, but when we listen to personal stories, these are the stories of a genocide. We have three sisters where one made a life-changing decision to help her mother during the war. And then we have the youngest one who made the same decision after the war because their circumstances did not change. They live in Zhivinice, which is where most of the Srebrenica genocide survivors um, ended up after July 11th. And they sort of made their home in Zhivinice, but they're reminded on a daily basis that this is not their home. Yet they cannot go back to Srebrenica because of the pain that they have suffered. And um, how was I able to even uh, record these stories? Well, the Genocide Film Library followed the Shoah Foundation and the methodology that they employed. The Shoah Foundation uh, recorded approximately 52,000 stories of Holocaust survivors. And what they did, they focused on their lives before the war, before the Holocaust, during and after. And this is what we did at the Genocide Film Library. And one of the things that every single survivor emphasized was that they have not been given an opportunity to talk about their lives before the war, and that their identity has been sort of stripped to the victim identity, and that they are fighting on a daily basis to sort of overcome that. And what we, and what I tried to do, is really give them an opportunity to become an educator, because I think they are the most effective educators. When we hear about personal stories, those are the stories that sort of give a meaning to history, to the context of the events that took place, but also to the court judgments. Because when we read the court judgments, they're based on facts, numbers and dates, and they do not give us a picture of how these people survived. How were some of the people able to survive the genocide where they were destined to be killed? And what are the after effects of genocide? And for the women of Srebrenica specifically, um, they are still searching for their loved ones, almost all of them. And for them, just finding one remain, one bone, as they call it, so that they can kiss it and say the final goodbye, is something that sort of gives them the strength to share their stories. And the Genocide Film Library really did that. The studio was a very homecoming studio. It was not a traditional or a professional studio. What we did, we turned the studio into a Bosnian living room. So we had a small camera, we had a small microphone, and what we really did, we wanted to have a conversation with them. And after a couple of interviews where I was trying really hard to gain their trust, I realized that I had to tell them that they were not telling the story to me and to the present generation because we know what happened. I had to remind them that these stories are for the future. And what I told them, and I asked them, uh, why did they decide to even share their stories? And they said for my great-grandchildren, the children that I will not get a chance to meet. So I sort of reminded them to look at me at that great-great-granddaughter who will go to Sabrinica, who will um, give a prayer to the victims, but who will not be able to meet the grandmother who lost everything and everyone in their family. And this is essentially what they did. Once they realized that they, their stories will matter more in 50 years than today, this is how they told their stories. And I think today and yesterday, when we talk about the definition of genocide, when we talk about the process of reconciliation, and when we talk about ICTY, which was established in 93 before even uh, Srebrenica happened, we need to remember that the survivors should be in the forefront, and this is where we need to start. And I think that the title of this conference is actually sort of pushing us to look into the past, to look into the memory of the survivors, because the ICTY is not creating the memory, they're creating facts. But with facts, we need the survivors to tell us how we can learn from the facts to move forward. Thank you.